After the collapse of the USSR and the end of the Cold War, nuclear threat receded into the background. But after the 24th of February, everyone is talking about it again. At the same time, like any complex topic, nuclear weapons are surrounded by numerous myths. To shed some light on the matter, we decided to devote not one, but two WAS videos to it. Our first video will tell you the history of nuclear weapons development. You will learn why Nazi Germany failed to develop a nuclear bomb despite all their efforts, but the United States succeeded. We will explore whether the Soviet nuclear program relied on German developments. Spoiler, it didn't. We will also find out what role espionage played in American and Soviet nuclear programs. Spoiler, a considerable one. Finally, we'll tell you about the first use of nuclear weapons in the world, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People used uranium salts as a yellow dye for thousands of years. The salts themselves are rather toxic than radioactive, but they still have a low level of natural decay. In the middle of the 19th century, it was discovered that uranium compounds exposed nearby photographic plates. In 1896, while studying the phenomenon of phosphorescence, French physicist Henri Becquerel discovered that radiation is uranium's intrinsic property and the energy is coming from the element itself. Becquerel's studies became the foundation for the work of Pierre and Marie Curie, who researched the radioactivity of elements. In 1938, German physicists discovered that one of uranium isotopes can separate when exposed to neutrons. This process released energy and created new neutrons, initiating a chain reaction of fission with energy release. This process formed the basis for all future nuclear bombs and power plants construction. Let's start with a bit of theory. The basis of any nuclear bomb is a fission of heavy substance. From the 1940s, uranium-235 isotope and plutonium were used in this process. The chemical properties of any substance are determined by the number of protons in its nucleus. At the same time, nuclei of the same element can contain a different number of neutrons. That's why different isotopes of the same element exist. For example, Natural ore of uranium, the main element of modern nuclear energy, contains isotopes of uranium-238 and uranium-235. A high concentration of uranium-235 is needed for a chain reaction. So, the uranium is subjected to enrichment, that is, separation of isotopes of one element. There are many methods of enrichment. The gas centrifuge method is mostly used nowadays. The effectiveness of every single separation is very low, so the cascades of thousands of similar operations are applied. This process requires an advanced economical and technological base. The second component of uranium ore is uranium-238. It is used to produce, through industrial transmutation, all the plutonium utilized today because plutonium rarely occurs in nature. A neutron moderator is also needed to capture the nuclei of uranium-235 in the nuclear reactor. So there are two ways to develop a reactor. Using enriched fuel and water moderator, or using natural unenriched uranium with heavy water moderation like the Germans did, or graphite moderation which was used by the Americans and then later the Soviets. Let's now return to history. In the late 1930s, everyone knew that the world was preparing for World War II. They were looking for a weapon that would give an unheard advantage to one of the sides. These sentiments were the strongest in Nazi Germany. So the research on the possibilities of atom splitting began there in 1939. They worked in two directions simultaneously, trying to enrich uranium and to create a reactor for the development of plutonium. The Germans chose a method of thermal diffusion to enrich uranium. But it didn't do well with splitting heavy elements. So the scientists had stalled and wasted at least one year. Germany had also rejected a scheme with a graphite moderated reactor and unenriched uranium. Nuclear physicist Walter Both had established its incapacity. 
Historians argue on the reasons why the future Nobel laureate made such a conclusion. Some consider it a mistake, the others a deliberate diversion. Possible diversion is evidenced by both his career and his anti-war position. As you can see, it's possible to oppose a dictator, even if you're feigning obedience. Eventually, Germany chose one of the most expensive ways to implement a nuclear program, with heavy water as a moderator. Instead of a common hydrogen isotope, heavy water utilizes heavy hydrogen called deuterium with a very low neutron absorption. Heavy water for the program was delivered from Norway. The production required enormous resources and money, but what's most important, it was the only one in the world. Therefore, it became one of the main targets for British saboteurs. In February 1942, Germany launched the first experimental reactor called the Uranium Machine. But four months later, it caught fire and the operation had to be started over. And by 1943, after several diversions and airstrikes, Allied forces managed to stop heavy water production. The German experimental program agonized until 1945 and came to an end with the fall of the Reich. Afterwards, German scientists denied planning the development of nuclear weapons. On the 2nd of August, 1939, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to the President of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt. He said that Nazi Germany was conducting research to develop an atomic bomb and encouraged atomic research to begin in the United States. The success of the Manhattan Project was based on several factors. First, unprecedented funding. There was 200 times more money spent on the project than on the entire German atomic program. Second, involvement of the best physicists from all over the world, including German and Austrian scientists who fled from the Nazi regime. Third, successful spying on the German nuclear program. It allowed in particular not to repeat their mistakes. Fourth, uranium ore reserves from the Belgian Congo. This ore contains 60% of uranium. By contrast, modern extraction methods work even with a tiny percentage of uranium. The Americans were developing a uranium bomb and a plutonium bomb simultaneously. By the summer of 1945, the amount of produced uranium-235 was enough for only one bomb. Little Boy. It was developed with the so-called gun method where two uranium-235 cylinders with a subcritical mass are driven together at a very high speed by shooting one into the other. This method was later used in tactical nuclear weapons until 1992. Its main advantages were simplicity, reliability, and the ability to create a small diameter charge. However, it had low efficiency. Only 1% of all uranium in the bomb was involved in the reaction. But reliability was more important at the time because scientists were not sure that plutonium charges would work at all. Why? Let's find out. Unlike the Germans, the Americans used the uranium and graphite scheme to produce plutonium. Its workability was proved by the physicist Enrico Fermi. He was an Italian married to a Jew who left for the United States with his family in 1939 when the Jews were persecuted in Italy. The first reactor built by this principle, Chicago Pile 1, was launched on the 2nd of December 1942. It was a 6 meters, 20 foot, flattened sphere made of layers of uranium oxide and graphite blocks. The reactor had no cooling system, but its thermal power was also very low, only 200 watts, comparable to two incandescent bulbs. The main goal was to prove the very possibility of controlled operation of such reactors. Plutonium used in the Fat Man and Gadget bombs was produced in the first industrial B reactor launched in September of 1944. Its thermal power was already comparable to the power of modern reactors, from 250 to 2,210 megawatts. In February of 1945, plutonium charges from the B reactor were delivered to Los Alamos to create two nuclear warheads. The bomb looked like a sphere of plutonium surrounded by natural uranium. This time, scientists relied on an implosion method 
when a critical mass is created by compressing plutonium with a spherical shockwave. The central problem of this scheme is the need to calculate the time and speed of explosion correctly. It's a complex calculation task that's hard to solve without modern computing power, so the scientists were not even sure that an atomic bomb like that would work. To find this out, on the 16th of July, 1945, the Trinity test was conducted at the Almogordo site. It was a test of an implosion-type plutonium bomb nicknamed the Gadget. The notorious Fat Man was Gadget's technological copy in a protective cover. The date of the test was chosen deliberately. The Potsdam conference was to begin the next day. President Harry Truman only recently took office after the sudden death of Franklin Roosevelt. His authority was unstable and he needed some strong arguments in the negotiations. For the first time, an atomic weapon had become an element of political games. But why did the United States put the weapon into practice? Consider the political landscape at that time. Even after the German surrender, Japan continued to resist and prepared for a long siege. The Americans had full air superiority. Japanese air forces were almost completely destroyed. Japan had suffered great losses among civilians as well. Bombing Tokyo alone with incendiary bomblets and napalm took the lives of 80,000 people, but Japan was still fighting. Estimates showed that storming Japanese islands in a landing would bring huge losses to the American army, up to one million soldiers killed or wounded. Besides, it was important to prevent the USSR from increasing its influence because after the German surrender, the Soviet army could start to redistribute spheres of influence in Asia. Finally, it was very tempting to demonstrate the power of a new weapon as the main means of intimidation for the next few years. So it was decided not only to use nuclear weapons, but also to cause as much damage as possible. Singular compact military targets were rejected because there was no guarantee that a warhead would hit them. The bombing of Tokyo was avoided to leave someone to sign the surrender afterwards. And the bombing of Kyoto, because of its major cultural heritage, but Hiroshima as the center of army depots, a military port, and the location of Navy headquarters in the second Japanese army was considered a suitable target. On the 6th of August, 1945, the little boy bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Another bomb, Fat Man, was dropped on the 9th of August on Nagasaki. Approximately 150,000 citizens of two cities were killed by a shockwave. The number of those who died of radiation sickness and oncological diseases cannot be estimated accurately. Though the damages were comparable with the mass bombing of Tokyo or Dresden, the psychological effect was enormous. Besides, no one knew exactly how many bombs the United States had. So, on the 15th of August, Japan had already announced their surrender. The United States gained a monopoly on the possession of nuclear weapons. However, it did not last long. The USSR also started its theoretical developments on atomic bomb production in the late 1930s. In 1940, they created a schematic diagram of atomic bomb development with the splitting of total mass of uranium-235 in subcritical particles and their subsequent rapid fusion. Several factors slowed down the operation. Firstly, a lot of scientists were subjected to repression. Secondly, the bureaucratic machine rejected the application describing a principle of an atomic bomb operation. And when the Soviet Union entered World War II, a number of developers went to the front line and died there. Research on possibilities of splitting the atomic nucleus was restored only in autumn 1942, after numerous reports of similar research in Germany and the United States. However, the Soviets lacked the resources for the full-scale development of the atomic project. That's why the USSR decided to spy on the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project involved scientists from everywhere, including those working on Stalin's construction and keeping the relationships with left-wing organizations loyal to the USSR. 
That's how Soviet scientists got the main data on atomic bomb operation, reactor development mechanics, and implosion scheme. The preparatory phase of development of an atomic bomb, including design of the gaseous diffusion plant, production of heavy water, and so on, began during the second half of 1944. But the full-fledged work started after the Reich's defeat. NKVD hunted for results of German scientists' work and for the scientists themselves looking for them in the prisoner of war camps. But German developments turned out to be almost useless. Data from the spies in the United States was considerably more valuable, but still about 200 German scientists were involved in the development of Soviet nuclear weapons. The scientific and technical base of this work later helped to establish the Institute of Physics and Technology in Sukhumi, Georgia. The Soviets also couldn't count on the German scientific equipment that was either destroyed or sent to the US, and what was left had little value. So the main catch for the development of the Soviet nuclear program were 130 tons of yellow uranium oxides from German territory. Workers from the plant where uranium was transported didn't even realize what they had in their hands and used it as yellow dye. Later, this very material was used in the development of the first nuclear bomb. The USSR didn't have its own prospected deposits and it was hard to set up the extraction quickly. So the speculations about Soviets using German nuclear program developments are unreasonable. There was nothing to use except the material. Industrial espionage in the United States was much more effective. The work on the development of a nuclear bomb had accelerated after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The funding for the program had also increased. In 1946, the construction of a gaseous diffusion plant for separating uranium-235 began in Ural. The technology was already tested in the US. Three years later, the plant produced the first batch of enriched uranium. In those same years, the first Atomopolis Chelyabinsk-40 was established with a Mayak facility developing and separating plutonium for weapons. To work out the technology, the first experimental reactor F1 was built in Moscow. It was launched on the 25th of December 1946 and was almost identical to the Chicago pile. The first Soviet RDS-1 bomb had the same technological design as the American Fat Boy. It was an implosion-type plutonium bomb. Only those components adapted to the Soviet industry differed, like the aerodynamic body and the detonation electronic circuit. RDS-1 was first tested on the 29th of August 1949 at the Semipalantinsk test site. Production was put on full steam afterwards, and by 1951, 29 such bombs were manufactured. The subsequent history leads us to the Cold War nuclear arms race, development of thermal nuclear weapons, and the formation of a modern nuclear fear culture. But you will learn about that in our next video.